Good morning, everyone in Lahore. I'm very happy to be part of this international conference. I'm Professor Rekha Pandey from the University of Hyderabad in uh, India. I am very glad that all of you are today discussing on gender issues and especially related to a South Asian perspective on feminism. So what I'm going to speak is, I'm going to talk about uh, South Asian perspective on feminism with special focus on India. Over the world, when we look at it, there is a very close relationship between feminism and women's movement because each has inspired the other. When we talk of feminism, any basic definition of feminism or feminisms can start with the assertion that at the center of feminism is the concern for women's subordinate status in society with the discrimination encountered by women because of their sex. Today, when we look at the 21st century, we have enough reasons to be proud of our unique achievements from stepping into the moon of cloning of genes, bringing longevity to lifespan, fighting diseases. There has been a long list of achievement in science and technology. So many people think that, you know, feminism is not even relevant today. It may have been necessary 100 years back where women could not vote, they lacked legal power, and they were strongly discouraged from working outside the home. Today, women are a significant voting block. They have gained power and uh, there are many CEOs in the company. So people ask, what is the equality that we are looking for? In spite of all these, we find that women still face a lot of obstacles when compared to men. And overcoming these obstacles require uh, um, a kind of uh, you know feminist perspective and feminism therefore continues to be uh, relevant and we really need to give a lot of support to these kinds of movement you know when we are talking of movements like million women rise the me too uh, campaign women have marched they have campaigned around different uh, issues so today we see a new phase in fact i can call it the fourth wave of feminism where there is a lot of activism, both dynamic and uh, creative. And therefore, you know, feminism becomes very relevant in the um, face of all these uh, uh, development. And we need to really uh, look at all the challenges which women face in social, political, and economic uh, uh, areas. When I talk of South Asia, South Asia is home to one-fifth of the world's population, consisting of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, Maldives, and the British India Ocean territories. We have a civilization which is more than 5,000 years old. It has hosted different cultures. It has created a land with diverse belief where the modern concerns mesh with the traditional values. And yet this region has seen a lot of conflict political instability. There has also been wars between the regions, two nuclear states, India and Pakistan. All of us have experienced you know, colonialism uh, where we were subjugated and India you know, got its independence you know, only you know, uh, later on. Now, because of our experiences of colonialism and exploitation, we have not been able to keep up with the development of capitalism in the world. And yet, in spite of that, we see that today this region is characterized by a high economic growth. And yet, poverty is also a reality of a large uh, uh, population. In spite of globalization and modernization, what characterizes South Asian region is the hold of traditional values and cultures over people and families, which are very patriarchal. Family members have different power in the family relationship depending on their gender, role, and uh, status. So we have to really uh, look at this from this kind of perspective. Today, we have ushered in liberalization of economics. There has been a forced structural adjustment, climate chaos, criminalization of indigenous and lower caste uh, population and yet there has also been rapid technological uh, changes and uh, South Asian women are one group 
that faces multiple intersection operation depending on class, caste, religious location. And uh, when we look at India in the 19th century, we find that the Britishers were criticizing us because we were not treating our women properly. We had so many issues like child marriage, illiteracy, sati, treatment of uh, widows. And therefore, at this time, we had a massive social reform movement which emerged. It was led by Raja Ram Mohan Roy of the Brahmo Samaj, Dayanand Saraswati of the Arya Samaj, Justice Ranade, the pioneer of Pratna Samaj, and Pandita Ramabai, who founded the Sharda Sadhan. The colonial state also played its part because a number of laws were passed which outlawed, you know, sati, you know, widow remarriage, female infanticide, special marriage acts was passed, age of consent was raised to 12. Uh, Child marriage restraint act was passed and women got limited right to property. Yet in spite of this, we find that there is so much of a gap between the law and how it is implemented. So after you know india became independent we find that uh, unlike the women in the west women got the right to vote women became equal partners in development yet in the 90s and 60s there was a spate of movement in which women took part there were campaigns against rising prices movement for land rights present uh, movements etc and women from all over the country came together. They participated in these movements, transforming the movement from within. But the whole myth of equality for women was shattered by the path breaking towards equality report that was published in 1974. It focused attention on the fact that despite many progressive social legislation and constitutional guarantees, uh, women's status had really not uh, improved uh, much and women continued to be a lot of uh, um, um, you know in uh, a lot of uh, uh, deodorant uh, the, we have facing so many crises uh, uh, today that uh, um, we will uh, um, you know our major problem is that uh, there is the situation of the unwanted uh, girl child. And um, if you look at the national trend, we see that there is such an adverse ratio. In 1901, for every 1,000 boys, we had 972 girls. By the time we come to 2011, there were only 914 girls for 1,000 boys. You know, in fact, to be born female comes closer to being born less than human. Discrimination begins even before birth. There is reluctance to seek medical aid. Uh, girls are fed um, uh, for a shorter duration than boys. They are easily withdrawn from school to look after uh, their uh, siblings. Gender roles are conceived and taught and enacted in a very complex set of relationship within the family and society. So the girl child grows with a very low esteem. She has this notion that she's only a temporary member in her natal home and has to be disposed of with assets and properties. If you look at some of the proverbs today, you know, they tell us of this bias. There is a proverb in uh, Telangana which says, bringing up a daughter is like watering a plant in someone else's garden. If you tell lies, you will have a, a daughter. A daughter is like a ghee, clarified butter. Both are good to a point and you need to dispose them off before they start stinking. So, you know, these biases continue. Girls are seen as chattel to be disposed of. Now, she is only regarded as a sojourner in her natal family. And uh, what we find is, besides this, another major phenomena is we have early marriages in India. Today, nearly 50% of the girls are married before they attain the legal age of 18. In fact, United Nations list, India stands fourth in this regard with a tie up with Bangladesh. It is Niger which heads the list. We did have a child marriage restraint act which was passed under the colonial government. Again, in 1978, the minimum age of marriage for girls was 18. But 
in spite of this, you know, there was a punishment given that the parents will be punished for you know, three months. They would be, the boy would be imprisoned for 15 days and a fine of 1,000 rupees was fixed. Yet, uh, you know, this has hardly been uh, respected and many child marriages, at least in rural areas, continue. A large number of girls drop out of school because they are so much engaged in domestic and child care activities. Another thing which is very important is that in Asian cultures, we have defined masculinity at the expense of women. So a man's honor rests in women. The worst hit in a caste war and communal clashes are women. And in uh, many of these societies, women do not have uh, property rights. And so uh, they are easy targets. In fact, if you look at the life expectancy of men when compared to women, it is the worst um, in uh, South Asia. In South Asia, uh, you know, women live only one year more than men, which is the lowest in any region. Because by uh, uh, and large, women have a genetic biological advantage, which makes them more resistant to infection and malnutrition. In developed countries, the life expectancy is seven times more than that of men. And again, you know, women face so much violence. In fact, every day when you look at it in the newspapers, in the television, we hear so much of violence against women that it has almost become like a statistics. You have violence at home, in public spaces, in state, even in uh, families. And uh, we find that, uh, uh, you know, another major issue is trafficking of uh, women because um, uh, a lot of uh, money is generated to trafficking. There are scholars who say, you know, the largest amount of money generated is through arms trade and uh, drugs. And in these cases, when the person is convicted, they are the ones who are put behind bars. And uh, yet in trafficking, the person goes scot free and it is only the women who are uh, put behind uh, bar. Today, uh, uh, you know, globalization has changed uh, in a, a large number of uh, ways. We find that, uh, uh, you know, uh, women have also been benefited by it. And yet we find that women have raised a lot of questions related to development from a feminist perspective. They have raised issues of childcare, reproductive rights, violence against women, family planning, transfer of technology, rural development. And they have given the whole uh, concept of development a new meaning from a feminist perspective. Development has to be an integral process with uh, economic, social, and cultural aspect leading to a control of one's uh, life situation. And here is it where we come across the concept of uh, empowerment. And therefore, you know, whether we look at it in the context of India or even South Asian perspective, we find that in spite of many challenges to feminism, it remains very relevant. Gender equality is necessary for the future of the world. We need to listen to voices of women from different cultural backgrounds that are calling for culturally located response to patriarchy and men's domination. Feminism has to be localized and particularized, but it must be essentially uh, recognized as a very important part of an interdependent uh, world. Thank you very much.